Subcommittee will come to order. Welcome to the Ways and Means Oversight Subcommittee hearing on the IRS record retention policies improving compliance. Last year, the IRS processed 244 million tax returns. Among them are individuals, small businesses like my own, who must retain, retain their tax records in case the IRS ever wants to review them. The IRS must also identify retained records to define lengths of time in accordance with the federal requirements. These records may later be needed to respond to requests from Congress, private citizens, or those bringing suits against the IRS. All of these parties have a right to ask the IRS to produce complete records, and the IRS has a responsibility to provide those records. However, TIGA found that the IRS policies do not comply totally with the, all the IR federal requirements, which ensure that all records are readily retrievable and usable, especially the production of the IRS emails currently rely on the IRS's ability to search thousands of employees' hard drives or alternatively each employee's ability and willingness to print and, fi and file important emails. Neither system is sustainable or reliable enough to satisfy the voluminous records requests uh, received by the IRS. The IRS also changed its record retention policy three times since 2013, creating confusion across the agency. Additionally, the IRS has failed to stand up to a basic email system capable of automatically archiving employees' emails. These issues ultimately reduce transparency, open the agency to exposure, exposure to civil lawsuits, and inhibit congressional oversight of the IRS. They also create a double standard whereby the IRS is not required to maintain basic records in the same way that the average American citizen uh, must do. No individual or small business could do the same and not be subject to punitive actions by the IRS. Furthermore, this issue has been raised repeatedly by Congress uh, to the IRS for years without a permanent solution. So here we are today to discuss TIGA's most recent finding and the IRS progress in, in addressing these concerns. I believe members on both sides of the aisle want to ensure IRS has the authority and the resources it needs to administer the code. However, in return, we need to see stronger efforts by the IRS to ensure that records are properly retained and easily retrievable. We would also like to see the IRS work to improve how it procures and implements its IT system. To that end, I look forward to hearing from the witnesses today. And now I yield to the distinguished ranking member, Mr. Lewis, for the purposes of an opening statement. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for holding this hearing. We'd also like to thank our witnesses for being here today. As the Broader Ways and Means Committee discussed the tax reform, our subcommittee will play a very important role in improving the Internal Revenue Service. Today's hearing will examine IRS policies to store, archive, and produce records, including electronic mail. We will also review the IRS ability to respond to legal Freedom of Information Act of third party requests, including those from members of Congress. In 2015, the agency received over 10,000 FOIA requests and closed over 99% within an average of 23 business days. The few requests that took longer than 20 business days generally involved privacy or other legal issues that prevented a timely response. We all agree that federal agency must process and reply to any request for relevant electronic and other records in a timely manner. For any agency, including IRS, information technology is key to meeting this standard. This is one of the many reasons that Congress must ensure that the agency's IT system are not only fully funded, but also fully staffed. Since 2010, Congress cut this agency's budget by almost $1 billion. That's a lot of money. That is a big cut. In the last five years, the agency IT budget was cut by $71 million, and the IRS lost nearly 290 IT employees. Many of you heard me say it in many times, and on different occasions, that you cannot get blood 
from a Turner. Early this month, early this month, the Treasury Inspector General for Tax Administration released a report on the IRS electronic records retention policy and IT system. The TAGA report made five recommendations, and the IRS agreed with every single recommendation and suggestion. As we move forward, we must remember these lessons learned, and we must be mindful of the IRS IT system needs. Mr. Chairman, together, we began a good, inclusive process, and I hope that we can continue our strong bipartisan work to improve the IRS. Again, I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing, and I look forward to the testimony of our witnesses in a year back. Without objections, other members' opening statements will be made part of the record. Today's witness panel includes three experts, Gregory Kutz, Assistant Inspector General for Audit for Management Services and Exempt Organizations at TIGA, Jeffrey Trebinio, uh, Deputy Commissioner for Operations Support at the IRS, and Edward Keelan, Director of Privacy, Government Liaison and Disclosure at the IRS. The subcommittees will have received your written statement. They, they will all be made part of the formal hearing record. You have five minutes to deliver your remarks. We'll begin with you, Mr. Kuntz. Uh, you can begin when you're ready. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Lewis, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to discuss electronic records management. Today's testimony highlights the results of our recently issued report on this matter. My testimony has two parts. First, I will discuss our findings and second, I will discuss our recommendations. First, the IRS is required by federal law to retain and produce records when requested through appropriate means. However, the IRS has had challenges responding to several high-profile requests from the Congress, the public, and the courts. The loss or destruction of information resulting from this is a result of inadequate systems and processes along with human error. Some key findings from our report include, the current email system does not meet federal requirements for storing and managing email messages. We reported last year that IRS's previous attempt to implement a new email system was unsuccessful at a cost of at least $12 million. Electronics record storage policies have changed repeatedly since May of 2013. The policy has changed from wipe and reuse information technology to save everything, to wipe and reuse equipment for all but two parts of the IRS, to the current policy of refrain from wiping the data from any hard drive. It is not surprising that this has resulted in some confusion. Storage of tens of thousands of laptops and hard drives at dozens of locations across the country is not a sustainable record keeping solution and the interim policy for IRS executives to archive their emails was not implemented effectively. Although many challenges remain, progress was made in several areas during our audit. For example, IRS has developed a new policy prohibiting the use of instant messaging for official business and requiring any instant messages that are a federal record to be retained, and improved policies for preserving records for separated employees. In addition, the IRS's most recent attempt to implement a new email system is planned to be completed by the end of this fiscal year. We also found that IRS closed over 70% of Freedom of Information Act requests within 20 business days as required. Moving on to my second point, as you mentioned, we made five recommendations to the IRS to enhance its electronic records management. These recommendations include implementation of an enterprise email solution that enables the IRS to effectively organize and retain emails. Develop an accurate list of executives and ensure that their emails are archived. Enhance processes related to retention of records for separated employees and ensure that FOIA policy is followed by all employees responding to requests. As Ranking Member Lewis mentioned, the IRS agreed with all five of our recommendations and is taking action. TIGDA will continue to monitor the progress of the IRS in enhancing its electronic records management. 
In conclusion, given that the IRS expects taxpayers to retain records for years in support of their tax returns, IRS's ability to do the same is essential to maintaining public trust. Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Lewis, that ends my statement, and I look forward to all of your questions. Thank you, Mr. Tribbiano. You're recognized. <clears throat> Good morning, Chairman Buchanan, Ranking Member Lewis, and members of the subcommittee. My name is Jeff Tribbiano, and I'm the Deputy Commissioner for Operations Support at the IRS. And I appreciate this opportunity to testify today. In my position at the IRS, I oversee internal operations, which includes information technology, human capital, finance, privacy, procurement, planning, facilities, security, enterprise risk, and the Office of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. Joining me today from the IRS at the witness table is Mr. Edward Killen, the IRS Chief Privacy Officer. Over the years, the IRS has worked closely with the National Archives and Records Administration, NERA, to improve our processes and protocols in regard to retention of federal records to make sure they are appropriate and work properly. We recently have made several significant investments in and important progress on a number of fronts to improve our records management practices for email and to update our existing records management policies, procedures, and practices. Our work still continues in this area. In particular, we are well on our way to completing the implementation of an enterprise-wide solution for the preservation of electronic records of the agency. This will bring us into compliance with the Office of Management and Budgets Directive requiring all federal agencies to have email in an electronically accessible format. More broadly, we are also taking a number of other actions to improve records management. These include the following. We have updated policy and procedure guidance on electronic messages, usage, and preservation. This includes guidance on the preservations of instant messages. We have enhanced our clearance procedures for employees who leave the IRS so we can identify and preserve federal records on separating employees before the employee departs. We are in the process of upgrading our e-discovery capability to a modern cloud-based set of tools. This will allow more quickly and efficiently for us to meet our discovery obligations in relation to litigation or governmental investigations. In the area of training, we recently released the first annual records mandatory briefing for all IRS employees and managers. And this course is designed to heighten an understanding of records retention responsibilities. And regarding the Freedom of Information Act, we are upgrading the software used for the day-to-day -day management of FOIA. Although the IRS already responds to more than 75% of FOIA requests within 20 days, this new system will facilitate an automation and improve our effectiveness and efficiency in this area. Taken together, we believe these efforts to improve electronic records management are an important step forward. They are not only bring the IRS into compliance with NERA standards and the OMB Records Management Directive, but will also greatly enhance our ability to timely respond to Congress, the courts, and FOIA requests. We also appreciate the Treasury Inspector General for Tax Administration's recent review on our records retention policies and procedures. We agree with all five recommendations that in the report, and we believe they are helpful in our efforts to improve in this area. We have already made significant progress towards completing action on the recommendations and have implemented two of them, and we are on track to complete all of them by the end of this year. That concludes my opening statement, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, and thank you for your excellent testimony. We'll now proceed to questions and answers session. In keeping with my past president, I'd like to hold my questions until the end. I now recognize the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Swiker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I um, have a handful of things here, and I want to first get my head around a couple of things I was seeing in the notes here. Um, was there an attempt at a enterprise solution um, that, shall we say, failed? Uh, yes, sir. Why did it fail? Back we, in 2015, we identified and procured a hybrid cloud-based solution to implement the NERA requirements. There was a procurement protest on the procurement that we issued. GAO upheld the procurement, so all work on the program had to stop. Um, we had to go to our plan B, which was a on-premise based solution for the implementation, and that caused the delay in the project. 
Okay, so you were doing an enterprise cloud-based um, automated um, capture backup system. We were. We were. Or that's that's what had won, and then there was a procurement protest that stopped there you from adoption. was a adoption. protest, yes, sir, and GAO upheld the protest, which means we all. So you didn't rebid it. We went out to a different solution and rebid the second solution. Yes. And sir. the second solution was in-house retention. It was an on-premise solution. And now you're doing. An on-premise solution. On-premise that it will be fully automated that will sweep the, I mean, I'm seeing a number in here, what was it, 33,000 hard drives, if I were to count everything that's floating around out there, is it, going it, to be able to automatically back up and capture. All of our electronic emails will be backed up and captured on the on-premise solution, yes, sir. And um, direct messaging systems? The instant messaging system, yes, sir. Direct, uh, it, there, 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 but there, there is a piece of that. I mean, instant messaging, according to our policy, and Ed, you know, Mr. Killen can explain this in more detail, but it's, it's not supposed to be used to, for a formalized record. If it is, then that has to be copied into the system and stored. But if it is used, someone has to make that decision to save it? Yes, Congressman, that is correct. So, so um, you and I are working on something and we decide we're going to use the direct messaging system. Is that how you refer to your system instead of instant? Instant messaging. Um, I have to actually, as the employee, make a decision saying, oh, I need to hit the button for this one to be retained? That, that is correct. We refer to that as our office communicator system. Uh, and the employee would have to, uh, if a record is created, and we've been very clear in IRS about disseminating this guidance, but if a record is created, uh, the employee does have the affirmative obligation uh, to save to save that record. Wouldn't it be more elegant just to do a constant capture model? I I think part of the part of the context around sort of the instant messaging is that we found that it's a tool that is effective for um, um, for for collaborative dialogue uh, as mm -hmm. as our employees are working various issues, and so I think the part of the challenge is that. Uh, most of the most of the information associated with those instant messages would really essentially be transitory. Uh, they would not be authoritative records. Yeah. So, so, so you're basically asking an employee to say this is appropriate for retention. This isn't. I just I, I see a human factor that creates a level of fragility. And and look, I know we all have um, certain concerns of privacy and those things, but it's still a government document, even if it's transitory. Um, I'm just surprised you haven't designed um, a, a automatic capture. Just, you know, in today's price of storage, just capture everything and just, you know, build uh, search tools that are more robust, um, it, that may be easier in your life. But look, this is your area of expertise. Uh, I've been asked just because, and I only know a tiny bit of it, so I'm, you're going to have to educate me here. Talk to me about the security summit with some of our shall we say, folks in the private sector and what we're learning from their technology and what we can learn to adopt? I appreciate that question. The Security Summit has been um, a great success story uh, within IRS. As you know, uh, one of our challenges has been um, addressing identity theft uh, and, and working to protect taxpayers uh, from, from that crime. And so a couple of years ago, uh, the IRS commissioner decided that this would really be an opportunity uh, for a public-private sector partnership uh, to, to work together with, our, with the State Departments of Revenue and also with the private sector tax return preparer community in order to, um, in order to defend ourselves uh, holistically against this threat. And we really refer to it as the tax ecosystem. Uh, and one of the things that we have found, certainly, uh, is that where there are weaknesses in any one of those links on the chain, it actually impacts others. And so we decided that it would be great if we could all work together to try to share um, lead information, threat detection sort of information uh, in an effort to protect taxpayers. And so over the past couple of years, this has been uh, tremendously successful. We have to remain you know, vigilant, uh, but I am pleased to report today the commissioner will be announcing uh, later on today that over the past two years, we have seen a reduction in our identity theft inventory over, of over 60 percent. And Look, I think that's in large part attributable to those efforts along with others as well. Mr. Chairman, if there's a second round, I'd love to do some more exploring on this. Thank you for okay. your patience. I now recognize the ranking member from Georgia, Mr. Lewis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Deputy Commissioner, has the IRS received additional funding to implement 
the fine recommendation? Did you get more money to? No, no sir. I mean, the, the, the last increase that we had in this area to be able to, to implement was the, and we're really appreciative for, is the $290 million that Congress appropriated specifically for um, identity theft, cybersecurity, and customer service at our call centers. Uh, how have RF's budget reduction in IT impacted your operation? What more could you have done or accomplished uh, with more money? Appreciate that question. Um, the, our infrastructure in the IRS is, is very unique. It's large, it's complex. Um, you know, if, we, if you step back and look at all the stuff that happens within that infrastructure, you know, we process over 200 million electronic returns a year within the IRS infrastructure. We have two data centers that operate on a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week basis. We have over 187 million taxpayer accounts on the system. We collect and process um, all the records for $3 trillion in tax revenue. We process and release about $400 billion a year in refunds through, through this system. Uh, we have, if you look at it from, from all the things that we support, we have one of the world's largest audit and collection firms that, that we have to support uh, with 14,000 revenue agents and revenue officers. Uh, we have one of the largest law firms uh, that have unique requirements within the IRS uh, that we have to support from an IT perspective. Um, we also have and operate a large call center that handles about 64 million calls a year. That's, that comes out of our IT. Um, we also have a large criminal investigation force that has unique IT requirements that we have to support. We have also uh, process, receive, and digitalize over 80 million paper records that come in with tax returns and correspondence uh, within, within the IT infrastructure. So all of that, all of that work is what we protect every year for filing season. And when we have reduced funds, we have to then reallocate resources to the areas within that system that we believe need it just to maintain filing season. And what that does is it causes us to shift funds out of development projects that we're working on or other areas within the, within the system itself to be able to fund the filing season systems. And what I, what I would really like to do at some point is bring up my CIO and me, maybe meet with the staffs or any, any members of the committee and go through the complexities of the IT system. Now, I, I, I'll give you a few statistics on why it's important. You know, we have over 400 tailored applications in support of our lines of business. We have over 2,000 individual COTS products working across workstations, servers, and mainframes. We have over 14,000 physical and virtual servers that run the IRS. We have over 7,700 databases that support the servers in the mainframe environments, and we support over 82,000 desktops and laptops throughout, throughout the agency. So anytime that we have to shift funds because we have a lack of them to true up our filing season systems, it makes the other systems more vulnerable for downtime, uh, for longer times of repair, um, we have to shift technical experts around. We have a, a, a gapping in some of our, our technical expertise within IT. So we have to shift physical resources to the systems for filing season, which takes them offline for development and production of new systems or upgrades. So it has, a, it has, a, it has an impact on our ability to operate. Mr. Assistant Inspector General, what is your reaction to what, the, uh, what has just been stated? I don't understand how you continue to function. Uh, the agency have been cut by uh, more than $1 billion during the past uh, few years. Certainly in the information technology area, they've had turnover, they've had a reduction in staff, and they're thin in a lot of areas with expertise. And there are a large number of people, like 40% of the people there can retire by 2019. So they do have a human capital challenge within information technology. The topic of today's hearing, I think it's a combination of systems, processes, and training of people involved in this. So it, money is one factor, but so is management, processes, and then human beings that are trained, and there's in control controls in place to follow up to make sure that in this case, records are retained and preserved in the way they're supposed to be. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for being here. Thank you, three, for your testimony. Are you back? Ms. Lorsky, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks to our witnesses for being here as well. The General Services Administration offers something called Blanket Purchase Agreements, or BPAs, 
They cover a wide range of suppliers, supplies and services, but are generally designed to streamline the procurement process by functioning as sort of a charge account with trusted suppliers. One such service covered under a BPA is what's called cloud-based email as a service, which we touched on a second ago, solutions. It's basically a fancy term for things like email, calendar, contacts, collaboration services such as Instant Messenger, and to aid in record retention requirements, archiving, and searchability. This particular BPA allows an agency to pick from a range of services from 14 different companies. To make it even easier, the GSA even breaks down the services into this handy grid to make it easy to see what's being offered and by whom, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so, however, the TIGTA report on the IRS's failed acquisition of an enterprise email system showed that despite going through the BPA process, the IRS purchased items that weren't on the BPA. They purchased something with a similar name as the one on the BPA list, but it was a different product. A company successfully challenged the purchase with the GAO and the IRS had to abandon the contacts and start over. Taxpayers spent $12 million on software that was never used. Mr. Tribbiano, or, uh, Mr. Trib Tribbiano, can you walk us through how something like this happens and what you're going to do to prevent it from happening again? Because basically what it boils down to is you pick from something not on the list, taxpayers get stuck with a $12 million bill, and this isn't used. So what safeguards are in place from that experience to say, oh my gosh, we made a mistake, we're never going to do this again? Because in my district and fellow Hoosiers in the state of Indiana, $12 million is a lot of money, especially for something not used sitting on a shelf. So what safeguards are in place now that weren't before? Hey, um Yes, ma'am. The, the, at that time that that was done, it's my understanding that there was an assessment done on that blanket purchase agreement and that the products that we were going to purchase off the blanket purchase agreement was allowed within the range of products that were being offered. Um, it was only when the protest happened, I think. The lawsuit? The, the, when, they, when the GAO came back and basically said you've purchased something that's not on this list? Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't remember or read the language of what GAO said. I know that GAO came back to us and said, we're upholding the protest that was filed by a vendor. And then when that happened, we turned to what our plan B would be, which would be on the on-premise solution. And we went out and, and contracted for that. So the safeguards that are in place is we have a, a mechanism now within our, our procurement office that has a process and has a policy and process in place that has a secondary view of any schedule that we go to on blanket purchase agreement that allows us to have that secondary sign off. And by, have they caught anything, this, this new group? Have they been able to catch those same kinds of actions? Have they been like the watch guard to make sure this doesn't happen again? Has that been successful? Yes, ma'am, I think it's been successful. I have not seen anything, or when I, when I talk with the chief procurement officer, I haven't seen anything that, that would, um, would, would stand out as a large item that went through or, got, or was stopped. But I'm being briefed that it's a successful process and that um, a, a, a process that happened like that in the past should not happen again within, within the IRS. I appreciate it. And then, uh, Mr. Coots, do you believe these actions are sufficient, these safeguards, that they will be the net that catches this kind of cross-confusion and especially to the tune of $12 million just with one action alone? Yeah, I mean, we and GEO concluded that the blanket purchase agreement, the cloud solution was outside the scope of the blanket purchase agreement. We and GEO both agree, believe that at this point. But we'll, we'll see. I mean, they're supposed to have their new email solution done by the end of this fiscal year, and whether they're there, we're going to be doing work to follow up on that uh, and determine whether it's implemented effectively. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Ms. Del Benny, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks to all of you for being with us this morning. Um, Mr. Coots, in your testimony, you state that there are many security measures in place for documents um, that are pictured in the photographs that are attached to the end of your report, and that the vast majority of the items in the photographs are generated from the replacement of aged equipment. Um, I wondered if you could talk to us about the reasons why an electronic storage option wasn't used. Um, so if you're phasing out old equipment, really the question is, um, why not store documents in the cloud or in some other electronic format that could be searched and um, secured? 
Well, their email solution does not automatically archive, as everyone's talked about at the beginning here. And so they have been saving, and I mentioned they were changing policies in my opening statement. Well, the yeah. policy that has resulted in that old technology and hard drives and other things being at all these locations is that they're saving it now because there's potentially federal records on that information. And so I think we have an issue here. Uh, we're all talking about going forward. Once IRS has processes to go forward, then we have to deal with the going backward. And they've got tens of thousands of these devices at 50 some locations across the country that are gonna have to be dealt with at some point. Some of them they may be able to find records in, other ones the actual hard drive may not be matched to the person. So I think when we talk today about the solutions, there's the going forward solution, and then Congress is gonna have to work with IRS what to do with the issues going backwards, all these devices being stored around the country that potentially have federal records that shouldn't necessarily be destroyed. And right now, they'd be kind of just kept as a printed form, or? Well, it's, it's growing. I mean, they're still, ba they're still re uh, keeping more and more items now. With the email solution going forward, that should help to some extent. But right now, the policy is backup tapes are being kept, hard drives are being kept, et cetera, indefinitely. And again, I think if we can fix the problems going forward, then the question is, what do we do looking backward to eventually destroy this information? Because it's a storage problem. I mean, there's large rooms filled with old equipment and hard drives and old laptop shells that are going to be there indefinitely until a solution is determined. And old systems that people may not know how to access well over time, is that? Well, that, that's a separate issue, the old technology with respect to, they have a hardware aged, and then they also have uh, systems that they're trying to upgrade and modernize also. Okay. Um, I also wondered um, if, any of you could elaborate a bit on the role that HR and IT play in retaining electronic records. Um, there's a lot of talk about, you know, employees printing records out and keeping them. Um, but how are decisions made to ensure that important information is backed up um, on a hard drive? Um, and, uh, and what are you doing to make sure it's not just maintained on a hard drive? Because that's also, if there's a crash or anything, you lose all of that information. So what, what's being done there? Thank you for the, for the question. Um, one, of the, one of the opportunities that we have as we are moving forward with our new email solution is indeed to move away from that reliance, uh, from that historical reliance on hard drives and on people saying th saving things on their local machines. Uh, because that is not an optimal way to preserve and archive records. You have limitations in the way that you can search and produce documents when needed. Uh, and so I think the, the good news is that the process that we are currently implementing to move to our new email system, system will address uh, a, a significant, significant aspect of that challenge. Uh, because the, the emails, uh, and that is predominantly in most of these sort of instances where authoritative records would lie, the email record will be in the server. Uh, there are requirements around what constitutes an appropriate electronic record keeping system, uh, and that will ensure that we are actively able to search, produce um, records uh, as appropriate. Um, as, as we move away, and one of the benefits of this is that we will no longer need um, the utilization of the hard drives because it has been previously a storage issue, which is why people were holding you're, you're, you're talking about email. What about other documents? Aren't there documents outside of email that you also would want to make sure that's a, that's backed a, up? Yes, ma'am. That's a fair question as well. And so uh, it really is a combination of tools that will move us into a better direction. Uh, it's the policies associated with informing people that you should not be storing um, federal records on your hard drives because there's limited access to that. So we're moving to collaborative sites where, uh, SharePoint sites, those sort of things where records should be and can be held where we will not have the storage limitations and so that people have a place to put those records. Email, the email solution we think will address a large, a large segment of it because if you sort of think about it from a practical standpoint, a record uh, is of limited utility if you're the only one who has access to it. Most records that are created are actually being shared or disseminated somewhere. Uh, so, so we think the email solution will help some of that. And for, for the remaining issues that we have, we're formulating a plan to address that to ensure that we have no gaps when we're done with this process because we do want to get it right. Thank you. I yield back. Mr. Holding, you recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Killen. Um, how many executives are at the IRS? Um, 
We have 251 um, SES executives. We have around seven senior leaders, um, and we still have um, two members on uh, that will be expiring shortly on streamlined critical pay. So these are the individuals that, I guess, for lack of a term of art, are the critical decision makers within the IRS. Would that be kind of how you describe executives at the IRS? Yes, sir. The um, and I think as we've we pointed out. TIGDA reported that there was no independent verification that confirmed the email accounts of these executives are actually configured to auto archive emails. So that was a finding. And um, you know, you're testifying today that changes have been made. Um, so are you able to say today that uh, the emails from those number of executives are being auto-archived today, and if not, what steps are you taking to ensure that they are being auto-archived? Sure. What, what I'm able to say today, sir, is that we are uh, actively implementing the solution that should address that. And when I, when I say that we're actively implementing it, it's meaning that we are currently in flight and migrating all of our IRS employees into the new email environment. Uh, where all of their emails will be saved and archived appropriately. Excuse so, me, Mr. Killing, is your mic on? The, the light is on, yes. Oh, okay. Let me get a little make sure. Okay. So we are, we are actively migrating to that new email environment. When I say active, meaning that we have literally moved over already tens of thousands of IRS employees into the new environment. We think that uh, for the most part, all of our executives have migrated over. And, and that's important because um, the, the root cause of the finding um, where uh, some of our executive emails were not configured properly was a part of an interim solution that we put in place um, as a stopgap measure on the path to our permanent solution, which we're executing against. So the important thing about that is that was a manual process. It depended right. upon people to configure their e so inboxes. So the, the, new, the new platform that you are migrating to will not be a manual process. It will be an auto archive. You won't be able to switch it on or switch it off. Correct, sir. It will be automatic and systemic. Okay. The, um, which one of you would be able to address the question of what forms of predictive statistical analysis is the IRS using to combat fraud, abuse, um, so forth. Um, I, I, I cannot speak to that, uh, nor can Mr. Killen. You know, most financial institutions, you know, when they're looking for fraud, money laundering, um, compromised accounts, I mean, they use forms of predictive statistical analysis that runs all their data through. And, um, you know, that's the reason why you, know, you get the call from your bank that says, you know, did you just charge this on your credit card? You know, it, it sets off red flags, and one would assume that the IRS uses something similar um, to what financial institutions would use to, to find that. Representative, I would, I would say that they, they do. I think they have a lot of filters in place to prevent refunds from going out improperly. And if so, that would be similar, I think, to what you're talking about, where credit card companies see indicators in the data that lead them to call you or to cancel your transactions or prevent you from making a transaction. They, they do try to filter up front before refunds are issued looking for fraud indicators. So if that's what you're talking right. about, they have quite a bit of that, over 100 of those types of filters. Well, and I, thank you. If, and if that is where, if that was the, where that that's, question That's was. some of it, but predictive statistical analysis is something a little bit different as well. The, um, you know, it's an analysis of all the data that you have. Um, the, are you aware of any software that the IRS buys from outside vendors um, that provides, you know, these services? And can you relate as to whether it's been effective for the IRS? Do you use it the, um, if you do buy it? Um, we, do, we do purchase outside software to help with some of our analysis work. And um, when we talk about return filing, we have a, a robust system of, uh, of filters to stop anti-fraud. We also have a team of, of uh, researchers within the IRS that uh, do research, applied analytics and analysis type of work and statistics work uh, that, that can predict and show patterns that are happening. I just can't speak to what they're using and how they actually do that work. Um, it falls underneath another group that, that okay. I'm just not caught. Thank not you. Familiar. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Mr. Cabell, you're recognized. 
Mr. Chairman, thank you very much uh, for this hearing. Uh, this hearing focuses on uh, an issue that I think uh, many of our uh, constituents are concerned about, which is government competence. And last week we'd had, I think, a similar hearing on Medicare fraud. I got a lot of questions back home from uh, Floridians uh, who wonder why, if credit card companies can be so effective at preventing fraud, why the government seems to be more focused on chasing fraud. Well, here we're exploring uh, a, uh, a similar issue, whether the government can be competent, can be trusted, whether we can help restore the trust and confidence in our government uh, and in our institutions. Uh, one of the issues that uh, the report we're discussing raises is the inability of PGLD to compel business units to respond to requests for records and to document uh, their search efforts. Mr. Killen, is that still the case today? We are, we are working uh, aggressively to improve our Freedom of Information Act request process. Uh, I would note um, that, that on the whole, uh, I think we, we do a good job of that, and we have 80% uh, timeliness in responding uh, to, to the FOIA request that we receive. But one of the important aspects of FOIA uh, is that you do rely on the custodian who has the record in order to be able to produce those records. Uh, so what we are doing is that we, we are revising uh, our communication mechanisms, we're revising our search memorandums uh, to make it very clear uh, what the responsibility of the custodian is in, in performing an adequate search for those records. Uh, we're revising our training. Uh, we are revising our quality, our internal quality review process to ensure uh, that we have um, a quality process uh, to ensure the efficacy of the, of the search. Uh, so we're taking a variety of tools. We're making uh, new investments and additional tools to help us locate responsive documents. Um, and so this is really an area where we've been intensely focused because uh, document retention and production are intrinsically linked. You have to have both working in concert in order to be successful. Um, we've got certainly work to do and, and we're committed to um, refining that and making improvements where needed. So we appreciate the, uh, the, the perspective of the IG and, and, and identifying areas that we can improve upon and we embrace that. Uh, and so this is an area that we're focused on. We feel like uh, on the whole, we do a good job, but, uh, but we certainly have opportunities for improvement. And so we're focused on that. And so you're confident that at the end of this process that you're undertaking, you will be able to effectively compel the agency to conduct these uh, searches and to, and to document them? I am, I am certainly confident that at the end of this process, we won't be um, two things. First of all, we will be in a materially better place than we have been historically. Uh, and, and secondly, I'm confident that um, we should be able to improve the process that we, that we currently have. Uh, and and that, is, that is what we're focused on. Uh, and I, I do think that we'll be in a better place. Uh, when, you, when you look at some of the things that really routinely cause us challenges and complications, uh, and uh, uh, Mr. Lewis spoke to it, it really is those very complicated requests we get in, complicated by virtue of the fact that the responsive documents could be hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands in some instances of, of pages. Uh, and so uh, the, the additional investments in our new um, uh, record keeping system and our new FOIA and e-discovery tools should put us in a better place. Uh, but it is an area where we will have to remain vigilant because it is complicated and nuanced. Uh, but we are, we are squarely focused on making improvements uh, because we realize that taxpayers have a right to request information of their government and we're committed to being able to provide that information. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Killen. Mr. Tobiano, in the time we have left, what is the agency doing to cooperate with these efforts to make sure uh, that uh, we can get the desired result? I'm sorry. Um, well, the two of the things that, that Ed mentioned was the actual training that's happening right now and the, the ability of our new eFOIA, e-discovery systems. So once we get our new email electronic record system in place where we can search emails and have the ability to search all the email records quickly, the other piece of that is having the tools to be able to go out from an e-discovery perspective and from a FOIA perspective to get through the documents, to be able to redact whatever needs to be redacted and produce the documents to go forward. So we're putting in place a, the policies that wrap around that to, in, to make sure that the information is flowing forward and that we're able to access all the records and get them through the process and get them to um, 
if it's a FOIA request, getting to whoever requested. If it's a, a legal aspect, getting them to, to, our, to our attorneys to go out. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Mr. Coos, uh, let me ask you, there are a lot of good findings and recommendations in the report from everything that you've presented today. What are the top one or two steps that the IRS has yet to complete that are critical to beginning the IRS in terms of compliance? I would say the electronic, uh, the new email system that they're supposed to have implemented, and apparently they're starting to roll it out now. Having that done as quickly as possible takes some of the human element out of it we talked about that relies on printing paper or saving to a hard drive or something. If you take that out of it, you're going to have a higher level of compliance. And I think then once we get to the point, as I mentioned earlier, going forward, something has to be done about going backward and the tens of thousands of devices across the country and all of the storage of that and what you're going to do to deal with that because that's a major problem and it's something that I think is it's costly for them to keep it like, like it is now. So some solution to that, perhaps working with Congress on that, is going to be critical. In terms of working with Congress, do you have any suggestions or things that we could be do, do more to be more helpful? Well, today's a great example. I think your oversight of this on a bipartisan basis is very important and, and holding IRS accountable for the dollars they get, the promises they've made, and making sure that they follow through on the actions that they say they're going to take. So certainly, with respect to the email system, follow up to see that they get it done at the end of the fiscal year or whatever their plan is. And then we're going to do work in the future, and we'll report back to you and IRS, on the actual implementation of that email system. So that's something we have planned for fiscal 2018, and we're very hopeful that they'll be successful, but we will do the trust but verify with you. Mr. Tribbiano, uh, let me, you touched on, uh, you mentioned emails, the questions have been brought up. This concept of the future state initiative, where are you at in terms of that process as it relates to emails? Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we are on schedule to uh, have the new email on-premise solution that backs up electronically all the emails from all the IRS employees, taking the human element out of it. Uh, we're scheduled to have that um, completed by the end of September. We have a, a end of uh, probably another 30 days after that for some work that has to, that has to happen in order to um, take the old email system offline and, and have everything over there. But what we're going to do beyond that uh, before, before our partners at TIGTA come in and take a look at what we're doing is we're going to have two independent uh, verifications and validations done. One is we're going to go out uh, while we're in flight in the month of October and ask MITRE, a, who it's a federally funded research and uh, development team, to come in and take a look at where we're at and make sure we met the requirements. And then we're going to ask NARA to come over and uh, take a look at it and make sure we met all the narrow requirements uh, so we can be confident that we, everything's backed up, everything's moved over, everything's where it's supposed to be. And then I know our, our partners at TIGDA will, uh, will come in after that and take a look and, and offer their opinion about or suggestions about anything else we can do to improve that. Now, that's just the, the future state of where we're going with the emails. You know, one of the, one of the, the issues and, and, and uh, my colleague brought it up, is all the hard drives that we currently have stored. And, and what are we going to do with those? Well, I can tell you the majority of those hard drives were refreshers, meaning we purchased a new laptop, so we copied everything off of one hard drive onto the new hard drive, which is now with an IRS employee, but we didn't destroy the old hard drive because we are, we are I would say, my words, nervous about doing anything that, that's going to remove any piece of digital information until we're sure that we have the new solution in place. Uh, then we will go through a systematic process to remove the hard drives that were just in laptops that were just refreshers in the process, get our disaster recovery tapes back into the cycle of copying over, which is what they're supposed to be doing. Uh, let me touch on one point. You thought you're going to have it in place by the end of September. We're almost in August in two months. Uh, the, this uh, future initiative. It seems like a lot of work in two months. Uh, what we, we've been working on it, sir, since when, when we initiated the, the secondary, the Plan B procurement for the on-premise solution. We did that in September of last year, and we started the implementation process and testing of it in January. And our first migration, the first people that started moving over, started happening in March. So we were working through it systematically to be able to make sure the, that we worked out the kinks on how employees would, would be moved over. And we've been in flight in that process. And our, our, we have a committed team of, of, of professionals working on it. And uh, we, will have it, we will have it done 
by the end of September of this year. Well, great. That's nice because uh, uh, I know they talked about September to actually hit the targets around here. It's pretty tough, but uh, good for you guys. Uh, Mr. Swiker, do you have another question? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I was hoping just because I have the talent here um, to go just a, a couple side questions that I've always been somewhat curious about. Um, uh, you're a taxpayer. Um, your records burn up. You know, something horrible happens, um, like my house right now with the monsoon leaking through my house. Um, so I turn to the IRS and say, hey, can I get copies of my last seven years of records? Um, tell me the process. Um, no, sir, I, I'm not exactly familiar with how, how that would happen. Um, there, there, are, there is a process that, that, that taxpayers can go through in order to receive information and get past records. There's information out there underneath get transcripts and other forms. So, but so where, where I'm going with this is um, uh, many of us have great interest in um, highly secure methodologies where I could actually use this to be able to access um, everything from my college transcripts to my IRS records to my vaccination records, those things. And you're, look, you're all very smart. You've all probably been tracking um, you know, the, the double pass systems in regards to a distributive ledger. Um, my understanding is even just with the number of servers you have throughout the IRS community, you could actually build your own node network um, and then um, build a world where, um, you know, NIST, as you may have know about 10 days ago, published a encry an encryption agreement or, or, or document saying I could carry my medical records on this and here's the types of encryption they would believe would be safe and uniform and could be commonly adopted across platforms. Um, the ability that, you know, have a biometric and a password. Could you imagine a world where myself as a taxpayer, I could log in with my thumbprint, my passcode, see my quarterly payments, see my IRS records, see my documentation, see how they relate to all my filings, and would that also change just even the paperwork load Absolutely. you have when I'm getting a loan and I have to document because I'm an independent contractor, so I have to have them have the IRS document my last couple of years worth of income. What type of visioning is going on at the agency to understand this world of technology that's out there that could make all of our lives much more efficient, much more elegant. Where are you going with it? That, that, that's a great question, and, and I know you guys have been in discussions with the IRS about the IRS future state, about where we believe the IRS should should go, and it's very similar to what you described. It's, it's, it's offering the ability for taxpayers to proactively interact with the IRS digitally if that's their, if that's their choice of, of medium. I mean, we still have to offer walk-in centers, call centers, and so forth for those that want to communicate in different means. But the majority of the public on the research we did says they want to be able to communicate and work with the IRS digitally like they would with a bank. Or well, well, you're already doing the project, and uh, this ties into the discussions with the Security Summit. If I use one of the package softwares, um, the TurboTaxes, the tax cut, whatever it may be, I can log in and see all my filings I've done through them going back several years, correct? So in some ways, we already know it's being done on the private side of the ledger. Um, it would be an interesting elegance from the security summit and then the concepts that if we're truly almost to a national standard for encryption using a distributive ledger and the fact that you have servers all up and down the chain, you could actually become one of the great node networks and control it. Yes, sir. Everything, everything that you described is always doable. The, the concern that, that we always, that I would bring up from my side of the house, not from the, the service and enforcement side, from my side, is that infrastructure. So as we transition to whatever that future state looks like, however we're going to interact with the taxpayers, however we're going to do that work, I have to still deliver a successful fi filing season in the current state. Mm -hmm. And that's what we talk about for the, the things that could be done to help us. It's to true up our current state of systems to protect the current filing season as we do the development 
towards that future state. And, and Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member, where this thought uh, moves through my mind is if we're truly going to deliver a tax reform that's much more elegant and simple, also at the same time delivering a methodology where um, American taxpayers have a more elegant way to use their base technology to see their relationships, see their filings, see their history. Um, it's sort of a unified theory of um, simplicity in technology. And with that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And let me just close on one other thought, because uh, obviously all of you have been uh, in this space for a long time. Our goal is, as a committee on a bipartisan basis, is to try to pr produce a bill, IRS reform by tax filing day next year. Maybe it's ambitious, but that's our goal. So we'd like to get your best thoughts and ideas as we move towards that. It's been 20 years. Uh, we want to try to be helpful in terms of the agency being more productive and effective long term. So that's the idea of a lot of these hearings, and we're going to be doing more of them. But any thoughts or ideas you've got towards that? I like the idea when we talk about the future state, because my mindset is I'm being in business for a lot, long time. I'm very big on planning and kind of thinking about where we need to be the next 10 or 20 years or five or 10 years down the road. Okay. I'd like to thank our witnesses for appearing before us today. Please be advised members have two weeks to submit written questions to be answered later in writing. Those questions and your answers will be made part of the formal hearing record. With that, the subcommittee stands adjourned. <laughs>